Neubauer, and she travels around the world. She's in Germany right now. I just got a email from her this last week. She was in Germany doing meetings, and she uh, goes there, and, and she's in her mid, um, I'm not going to tell you her age. I just stopped at that. But uh, she's a very precious lady and has great results. A lot of healings in her ministry. And a lot of people get saved, and a lot of people get filled with the Holy Ghost, and she blesses a lot of people. So we're fortunate she can come. She'll be here August 11th. And then um, we're working on some other people coming, too. I told you about that. But one of the other people that we have on the schedule is Cindy Black. Anybody remember Cindy Black? She was just here with us this year. What a tremendous meeting we had. And, um, and we're having her come in the very end of November. Uh, we probably even have dates but I don't need to, you, don't, you won't remember them by that time anyway. But uh, November, and we're going to do like a Christmas concert with uh, Cindy Black, and then we're going to have some services besides. And so uh, I want you to make sure that's on your calendar. You're going to like that a lot. And we do have some CDs by Cindy Black. This one's called Joy, and this one is called uh, High Places, and uh, this one is called Shout Now. That's a good one. I like that one. We play that one here every once in a while. And then this one, her husband is in, in heaven at this time. He went earlier than Cindy. But he would play the trumpet and was a very good trumpet player. Worked with um, uh, Dad Hagen and, and I think he also worked with uh, um, Phil Driscoll, I think, a little bit. But anyway, this is a healing anointing CD with Bruce and Cindy on the CD. So uh, be really, really good. Scriptures through song. Those will be in the bookstore after the service today if you want to check them out. And then, you can see why I was waiting to do this, because we had a lot of stuff here. That's Cindy Black. That's Cindy Black. Okay, this one is, uh, his name is Trevor Woods. And Trevor Woods, we've known for a number of years. He was on staff with the Dufresnes, and then he's pastoring a church in the Fresno area. And this one is called Evermore. This is a Christmas one. I know it's, you know, we got snow outside today, so <clears throat> get back in the spirit, everybody. And then this one is, uh, I sing only for you, Trevor Woods, and it's tremendous. You, you will really enjoy Trevor Woods. And then um, we have some books by Joel Siegel. This one is called Filled, The Results of a Supernatural uh, Spirit-Filled Life. All of Joel Siegel's books are tremendous. You're not going to be able to read them in one afternoon because they're so filled um, with, with uh, revelation knowledge and information that uh, you, you need to kind of ponder his books. They're like Dad Hagen books. And he traveled with Dad Hagen, you know, for a number of years. And he feels that his assignment is to kind of continue writing in the same vein that Dad Hagen did. And he's doing a great job. I don't know how many books he's got out now. We have, all, I think we have all of his books in our bookstore. So you can go in there and check them out. But anything you buy, his book will be very scriptural based and will really help you. And he has a, a unique way of seeing things that sometimes other people don't see and he puts it into his books. The Dogs Get the Crumbs, uh, Study in Humility, and then this one is Helping People Receive Healing by Joel Siegel. Those will all be back in the bookstore today also. I've been reading one of his books on, uh, it's called Assembled Together about the church, and man, I'm telling you, it is just um, tremendous. And I don't know about this book. How did this one get under? Oh, Cindy Black gave us this book, My Hindsight, Your Foresight. I don't, I don't know anything about it. I don't know what to say about it. So somebody buy it, read it, and tell me about it. Would you do that? How's that? Amen. Well, happy Easter. I was reminiscing today, especially because of snow outside, how a couple years ago when we couldn't be in the building because of what uh, the government was telling us we couldn't do, that we had Easter Sunday outside. Remember that? We had Easter Sunday outside. Remember it was snowing. Yeah, and, and uh, all the girls that were singing, you probably remember it was cold. Yeah, but you were all in your cars, so it was just us who were outside uh, in the cold, and, uh, and you know, I enjoyed that service very, very much, and those times when we would not allow whatever was going on to stop what we felt God wanted us to do, and um, I, I just uh, have great memories of those times, especially that Easter <clears throat> Sunday morning <clears throat> when, um, you know, we weren't supposed to do what we did, but we did. And it was great. I'm not telling you to do something that's wrong. What we did was right. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the resurrection. What do you think? 
probably a good subject for today. And so uh, I want to I want to read some of the portions of Scripture in your Bible. All four Gospels have an account of the resurrection. And I want to read a couple parts. I want to read more out of the Gospel of John. If you have your Bible, turn to John uh, chapter 20. And we find the account of the resurrection. Now, uh, we know that to get to the resurrection, we had to go through Good Friday. And we had to go through all of the events that happened the week leading up to Good Friday. And so your Bible can talk, you know, talks about them if you want to take time to study them. And I would recommend to you that you take time, today is a good day, to read the biblical accounts of the resurrection in all four Gospels. We're gonna, I'm going to touch on certain things in all four of them, but if you would just take time this afternoon to read the accounts, it will help you and it will establish some things inside your spirit man. So uh, starting with verse 1, this, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. And, and uh, remember how sad everybody was at the end of Good Friday when, when Jesus went to, um, went to hell. You know, really when he died, didn't he go down to hell? Of course he did. He went down into hell and he uh, rose from the dead and took the keys of death, hell, and the life with him, didn't he? Amen. He was the first one ever to be raised from the dead. He was um, the firstborn, we could say, among many brethren to come. And so um, everybody had kind of a bad weekend. The believers had kind of a bad weekend that week from Friday on, uh, you know, thinking that Jesus was dead. And they put him in the tomb and their hopes for everything were seemingly dashed and not really understanding what was going to happen. So the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she running and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth with the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. They ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. <clears throat> Do you ever wonder who the other disciple is? It's John. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't tell about himself. He just calls himself the other disciple. Yeah. I always thought that was interesting, you know. And he, um, the other disciple, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then comes Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying within the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Interesting. He saw and believed. Now look at this scripture. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And when that when they're talking about there, he knew not the scripture. What it's talking about is that they did not have revelation knowledge of what Jesus had said. Jesus told them that was going to happen. It was prophesied that it would happen, but they were never putting the two together until it actually happened. So they didn't have a revelation in their spirit about what was going on. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And she saw two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, the angels said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And then, when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, but knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? I'm paraphrasing a little bit from the King James uh, because, you know, Jesus didn't talk these and thous and this is. Uh, he didn't say those. That's just a translation. So she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him somewhere, tell me where you have taken him, and uh, I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And as she turned herself and said unto him, Rap, um, rabbi or teacher which is to say master and jesus said touch me not for i have not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say to them i ascend unto my father and to your father to my god and your god 
Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw it was the Lord. And Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then he said this in verse 23, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now I want to read that last couple of verses in this other translation. It's called uh, the Passion Translation. Um, the, 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 the words are the TPT. So I just call it the TPT, but I don't want you to get that mixed up with TP. And so uh, it's, the, it's the Passion Translation. And I want to just read you what he said there. So just give me a moment. And uh, we're going to go down to verse 23. This is interesting when you look at it a different way because some of the things that Jesus said there, <laughs> he said, whoever you remit their sins, they're remitted. And whoever sins you retain, they're retained. So what it sounds like he's, he's saying, what Jesus is saying is that he's giving authority to John to forgive sin. But I want you to know that Jesus is the only one that can forgive sin. Only God can do that. You cannot, I cannot forgive somebody's sin. We, if they've sinned against us, we can forgive them for that. But as far as sin that keeps you out of heaven, only God can forgive you of your sins. And so let's read it from verse 21 out of the, the um, Passion Translation. And Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. And he told them, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. Now, there's some things in all four accounts that Jesus says after he raises from the dead. How many know that that's important? Jesus came back from the dead and went to talk to his disciples. He called them his brethren. And when he saw them, he said certain things to them that would be impactful, wouldn't they? Now, I don't know about you, but I like to listen to, like uh, Dad Hagen, you know, we know he went to heaven in 2003. And so I like to listen, especially I was in a meeting with him in 2003. We were in a meeting for seven days, morning and night. And I like to listen to those services because the Holy Ghost knows uh, when Dad Hagen was going to go to heaven. Did you know that? The Holy Ghost knows. And so if the Holy Ghost knows, <clears throat> Dad Hagen, if he's praying and listening to his spirit, he's telling things that will be impactful to people. He wants, to, he wants to leave them. When, when um, Dr. Summerall came into our life, he came into our life in the, in the 90s, early 90s, and he told me a story about his time with Smith Wigglesworth. Now, if you don't know Dr. Summerall, you might not know about this story, but uh, Dr. Summerall was about 20 years old when he went to live in London, England, and he met uh, Dr. S or, or Smith Wigglesworth, and Smith Wigglesworth was a, they call him uh, uh, an apostle of faith. You know, so he was a man of great faith. He raised 23 people from the dead, uh, documented historical fact. And so, <clears throat> you know, we kind of figure if he could raise 23 people from the dead, we kind of want to know what he's got going on <clears throat> and other miracles and things that happened in his life. And so it ended up that Dr. Summerall met him and spent some time with him. They did a conference or two together in, in that area of the world. And uh, he invited Dr. Summerall to come to his house. And so over a period of a few months, maybe 10 months or maybe a little bit longer, might have been a little bit less than two years, he would go uh, once every 10 days or so to Smith Wigglesworth house and he would sit there and he said that Smith Wigglesworth would uh, meet him at the door, invite him in. He said they'd, they'd uh, read the Bible for two hours, have lunch, uh, pray for two hours and then uh, read the Bible for another two hours and then Smith Wigglesworth would say goodbye. And he said he would leave and then um, Dr. Summerall would always say, uh, when can I come back? And Smith Wigglesworth would say, you can come back as often as you want. So in telling me that story, Dr. Summerall said, I was a young man of 20. He was an older man of 80. He had it, and I wanted it. And he said, so uh, I would press in the spirit on those things that he had. And of course, Dr. Summerall received a lot from Smith Wigglesworth 
spiritually through impartation, but also in the natural when Smith Wigglesworth would talk to him and tell him about his authority and different things. Dr. Summerall greatly benefited from those times right before Smith Wigglesworth went to heaven. That was about the time of World War II. And so uh, the government asked Dr. Summerall to leave England. He couldn't stay there any longer. And shortly after that, Smith Wigglesworth went to heaven. And so there was a very precious time. So I believe it's the same with Jesus when he rose from the dead. He was telling his disciples things before which were important. And uh, after he rose from the dead, he came back and re-said those things, some of the same things. He re-said them again. Now, if it was you and Jesus told you before he went something and then came back after he raised from the dead and told you the same thing, wouldn't it have an impact on you? Well, it should have an impact on us, shouldn't it? Because really that's what happened. If we read the Bible, he's told us these things before. But if we look at what he said after the resurrection, we see some things that he put very definite emphasis on that are really critical for you and I to follow the will of God and to be able to be successful in what we're doing in our life. And so he said this, to, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. That's repeated in, in, in the, again and again. And what he says after he rose from the dead, I'm sending you, and I'll read it to you again in some other um, translations. Then, taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, it, very interesting, if you look at uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So this word that is used here is only used one time in the New Testament. And the word is exactly the same word that is used in the Old Testament when God created man. And when he created man, it says in the book of Genesis that he breathed life into them, or what he, he said he breathed on them, and what the original Hebrew said is that he breathed, blew in them, and made them a living spirit, that he created them, but then blew on them and gave them life. And it's talking about the same thing. When Jesus did this, he blew on them, and what he did was he, he, he deposited the Holy Spirit, or the life of God, the Zoe life of God into those believers. Amen. So what, what happened to them? They, they became born again at that moment. They became born again. They became uh, a, a, a new creature in Christ after the resurrection. Now that, that couldn't happen before the resurrection because Jesus had not yet died and he had not yet paid the price for the sin to be remitted from man. So what he did when he breathed on them is he caused them to become a living a, their spirit man to become alive to the things of God. Amen. It was so powerful that he, that he did that. And so he's talking here about having a personal, intimate relationship with him, with God. And he blew on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Now, today, uh, you in here today, many of you, if not all of you, have made decisions for Christ in your life. And you've asked Jesus to come into your life. Uh, you've either stood at this altar or some altar or in a car or somewhere, and you've made a commitment and you said, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I, I really need a Savior or some words to that effect. And would you please come into my life or I believe you are the Son of God and that God raised you from the dead and, and something like that you voiced with your mouth. The Bible said that in order for you to become a, a believer, a, a, a Christian, it, it's not that you're born in America that you're a Christian. It's not that you're born in a Christian family that you're a Christian. It's not that you go to church that you're a Christian. In order for you to become a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. You need to believe that in your heart and you need to confess that with your mouth. Somewhere along the line, if you are today, uh, uh, the terminology born again, the terminology saved, it all means the same thing. If you're born again today, if you are a believer, born again, saved, then you have believed in your heart and you have confessed with your mouth. Now, when that happened to you, it's the same thing that happened to those disciples after Jesus raised from the dead and he showed up and they believed, it said they believed that he was the son of God and then he breathed on them or the Holy Ghost came on them and made their spirit alive and they became the first sons of God in the New Testament. Like you and I today, are people that actually are alive to the Spirit of God. Nobody in the Old Testament had that experience. There wasn't one person. Now, the Holy Ghost would come on people, but he never indwelt them or lived in them. Now, do you remember what Jesus told them before he went to the cross in John chapter 14? He said, the Holy Spirit's going to come, 
and he's, I'm going to send you another comforter, remember? I'm going to send you another comforter, and what's going to happen? He's going to live in you, and he's going to live in you for how long? Forever. And you remember what Jesus said towards the end of that chapter? He said, I'm not going to leave you without appropriate help. In other words, in your life, there are things that are going to come along, but God has already provided for you to have all of the help you need in everything that he has done in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. He has paid for every single thing that's necessary for you to be successful in your life and live a good life and have a blessed life and you are not without appropriate help in any situation and any circumstance because the Holy Ghost is living in you and is dwelling with you and will never leave you. Amen. He's going to be with you forever. Hallelujah. We ought to be so excited about what happened in the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, the Holy Ghost could not come and take up residence in your mortal body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So in you today, if you're born again, the Holy Ghost is living in you right now, right here in this place. The Holy Ghost is living inside of you today. Amen. So he breathed on them. Then he said this, I send you to preach the forgiveness of sins. Now see, it's different than what it was worded in the King James. We're in John chapter 20, and we're in verse 22, verse 23. He said, I send you to preach forgiveness of sins. So he wasn't telling them that they had the power to take the sin away. What he was telling them is that they needed to go talk to people about the gospel. And people's sins will be forgiven. When you preach the gospel, people will respond. Some will respond instantly, some will respond later, but there's not one person that the gospel has been preached to that has not been impacted by the gospel in one way or another. There is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that power of the gospel. So there's power in the gospel. But if you don't proclaim the forgiveness of their sins, they will remain guilty. So in other words, what Jesus was telling them is unless you say, or there's a preacher that says, then people will not know that there's forgiveness of sins available. And if they don't know it, they will never respond to it. That's what he said. So what did he tell them in John chapter 20? He said that they received the Holy Ghost and he told them to go out and what? Preach the gospel. And he said, if you preach the gospel, people will respond and their sins will be forgiven. God will forgive their sins. If you don't preach the gospel, they won't respond and they'll remain a sinner and they'll die and go to hell. Pretty simple, isn't it? Amen. Pretty simple. That's what Jesus said. He said, I want you to go and I want you to preach and you receive the Holy Ghost. Now let's go to the book of Luke. And we're going to read some of this. And Luke, it's in chapter 24. And we're going to read about this. We already know. I'm not going to read all of the resurrection part because you're going to go home and read that this afternoon, right? <laughs> Let's see if you can all read it at lunch. So we're going to start reading with verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Remember in the Gospel of John said they just didn't know that yet, so he opened up then he said unto them, verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name. I want you to remember that, in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So isn't he saying the same thing now? He's telling them they need to go and they need to preach, right? And behold, and you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father unto you, but tarry in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem, until you be endued with power from on high. 
So what did he tell him in the Gospel of Luke? He said, I told you these things before, but I'm telling you again, you need to go and you need to preach. And he said, then you need to go wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now in John, he breathed on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So they became born again, didn't they? But now he's telling them about something different. He's telling them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, where the Spirit of God would come upon them like it did in Acts chapter 2, where they were all gathered in one place in one accord, and the Holy Ghost came upon them, and Jesus had told them, he said, you need to go wait and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So it's two different distinct workings of the Holy Ghost. What did Jesus tell them in John chapter 14? He talked to him about the power of the Holy Ghost. He talked to him about his name. Remember, he said, you're going to go preach to him in my name. When you preach to him in my name, the sins will be forgiven. He talked to him about the power of the name in John chapter 14 before he left. Amen. All right, let's go over to Mark's gospel. Pastor, you're going backwards. I know. I'm not going backwards. I'm going in the order that I'm supposed to go in. Mark chapter 16, Jesus Raises from the dead, right? And he comes back and talks to his disciples. We're going to start reading in verse 9. <clears throat> now when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She went and told them that she'd been with him, and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. <laughs> Uh, don't be too hard on them because you realize this is a pretty big deal. Nobody's ever been raised from the dead before. It's a pretty big deal. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked, and they went through the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they of them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and, and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And they said unto him, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, and he that believes not will be damned. Verse 17, And these signs will accompany or follow or accompany the believing ones. In my name. There he's talking about his name again. They will what? Cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So after, then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. What did he tell them? Go and preach. Seems to be a kind of a common theme, doesn't it? Go and preach. In other words, if you go and preach, and you preach in the name of Jesus, it's possible for people's sins to be not only forgiven, but how about gone? Like gone forever. Like you're, you're not a sinner anymore. Like they're gone. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So when you become in Christ, meaning when you become born again, you are made righteous. God declares you righteous. He takes, takes away your sin. You don't have sin. Amen. It doesn't mean you don't sin, but you are not a sinner. Your character has changed, is what the Bible says. So it's the same thing that Jesus is saying. He just said it, repeating it in the Gospels. All right, let's go to the Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. And I'm going to start reading in verse 18. Hallelujah. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Talking again about the name. Teaching them to observe whatever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So reoccurring themes in all four Gospels, he deals with some subjects the same, about preaching is the same, and then he talks about his name. Have you ever wondered when the power came 
into the name of Jesus? You ever thought about that? So we know that angels showed up at the birth and said you're going to call his name Jesus. But have you ever thought about when actually you and I, he said in John 14, he said that we would, he's going to give us his name. And so throughout his own life, people knew his name. They talked about his name. But do you realize that today, when you, as a believer, use the name of Jesus, that different things happen than they did to the non-believer or the before, before people could be born again? But there's, there's a time. I want you to go over to the book of Hebrews. And I want, I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 1. Something happened in the process of the resurrection that the power of God came into the name of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom he made all the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and this express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It's talking about Jesus, right? Being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So he got his name by inheritance, didn't he? For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten unto the world, he said, and that all the angels of God worship him. So there's a phrase in there, verse 5, it says, And this day have I begotten thee. When was that? That Jesus was begotten of the Father. Because we know that he existed from eternity. John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that he wasn't begotten because he really always was. And we knew that when he had the birth on this earth, he wasn't begotten because he already was alive. He said again in the place, I think it's in um, Philippians, he said uh, about his life, and he said that he had prepared a body for him to live here on this earth. So he wasn't begotten when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He already was in existence at that time. So when did this happen? This, this day is what it says here. This day, this day have I begotten thee. Want to look at some more scriptures? All right. So um, let's go over to... Acts chapter 13. Just stay with me a minute if you're wondering where I'm going. Acts chapter 13, and I want us to look at verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Interesting. Let's look at another verse in the book of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 2, because this is, this is um, Paul talking about this. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and this is Peter. Peter's talking about this. And let's look at verses 25 and 27. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, 
neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the time that Jesus went to hell, right? And what did he do in hell? He paid the price for your sin and for my sin. And then let's look at verses 29 through 31. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him, that, that of his fruit of the loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. He, seeing this before, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. <clears throat> this Jesus God raised us, raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. So what is he, he's talking about the same thing, isn't he, that, that Paul was talking about. So this day when he was begotten is the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. That is the day that he became the begotten son of God, is when he was raised from the dead. That is the day that he had paid the price for your sin and mine. That is the day that the name of Jesus became so powerful that in all three worlds, in this world, in that world, and the underworld, that the name of Jesus, there is no other name that has more power than the name of Jesus. That name became powerful when the, when the, the blood of Christ was shed for your sin and my sin, and all hell was defeated, and the name of Jesus became what it is today. When we use the name of Jesus today, all of heaven stands at attention. All of hell stands at attention. All of the forces of hell that are in this world stand at attention at the name of Jesus. When you use the name of Jesus over sickness, when you use the name of Jesus over uh, effects that the enemy is trying to have on your life, when you use the name of Jesus on uh, onslaughts of hell against you, that name has power today to destroy the strongholds of the enemy because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That name did not have the power before the resurrection. So once Jesus paid the price for your sin and mine, and he was raised from the dead, this is the day that God had begotten a son, and this is the day by an inheritance, he received a name that has more power than any other name on this earth, any other name in heaven, and any other name in hell. And you and I have been given that name to use as liberally as we want to use against anything that happens. It is a benefit to you and I because of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the name would just be a different name. Just be like any other name. This day have I begotten thee. This day on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the resurrection, the day that God raised him from the dead, that name became the most powerful name in all of history. The crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ, did not just come to change you and change me a little bit. It was the most powerful event in history. There is no other event in history that changed heaven, changed hell, and changed this earth. The most powerful event. Jesus didn't come just to help you a little bit. He came to change you forever and make you entirely different, to make you a new species of being, a new creature in Christ, where you are no longer bound by the laws of sin and death, but he has liberated you under the law of life in Christ Jesus. All of those things happen on the day that God raised him from the dead. It is the most significant event in history. Oh, it was significant than we went to the moon. Yeah, it was really significant. The Wright brothers had an airplane. There was different things in life that are very significant. Finding the 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 vaccines and, and finding the different things in medical history that, that can change life, but not any of those things are as powerful, are life-changing as the life and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of that today, you and I are equipped with everything that we need to be successful in our life. God never intended 
that you would live a life without Christ. That he intended that every person would be able to have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And by the preaching of the gospel, by the preaching of the gospel, men's lives could be changed forever. Could be changed forever. Your life changed forever by your relationship with Jesus Christ. My life changed forever. Not the same person I used to be. Not the same. Not the same. Not subject to the laws of sin and death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection. Thank you for the resurrection. All those things happened on the day that God raised him from the dead. If we go to the book of Acts in chapter 3, we can see the effect of what happened to the disciples when Peter realized the power that was in the name. Peter and John went to the temple, third hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate, which is called Beautiful, to ask of alms who entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John, what? Fastened his eyes upon them. John said, look upon us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name. In the name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What? Rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name. In the name. I'm telling you there's power in that name. Power in that name. In the name. In the name. It wasn't the name of Muhammad. It wasn't the name of Buddha. It was the name of Jesus. In the name. In the name. In the name. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Well, that was Bible days, Pastor. It's different today. No, it's not different today. The name of Jesus has not lost its power. The blood of Jesus has not lost its power. This morning, the blood of Jesus can cleanse you and wash you and make you free from your sin the same way it did over 2,000 years ago when Jesus was raised from the dead and he told his disciples, go and preach. If they listen, they can be changed forever. Doesn't matter what has you bound. The blood of Jesus is sufficient to destroy the effect of hell in people's lives. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've come from, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you are. The blood of Jesus can change your life, situations and circumstances. Doesn't matter what's happening in your life. If there's problems in your life, if there's sickness in your life, if there's issues in your marriage, if there's issues in, your, in you, the blood of Jesus is sufficient the name of Jesus is sufficient to change things forever. And you can become different. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash you and cleanse you from all because of the resurrection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Over my years of ministry and travel, we've used the name of Jesus liberally in many different places, in many different situations and circumstances. We were in Russia traveling. Billy was with me. We were in Russia. One other gentleman was with us. 
we had gone through passport control. We were leaving the country. We'd already been there and had great meetings. <clears throat> we were leaving the country, going through passport control, and Billy went through. We had to go through different lanes. Billy went through. I went through, and we're waiting for the other gentleman to come through, and he comes out, and I said, all right, let's go catch the plane. We were close to catching the plane. He said, well, I can't. I have to wait here for a minute because uh, they got my passport. I said, who's got your passport? He said, well, that lady in that booth there, she, she took my passport and said that to wait here and she'd come back. I said, well, what else did she say? So that's all she said. And in my spirit, I knew that something was not right. And Billy and I are standing there and I said, well, <clears throat> we're not going to the airport without you and you're coming with us and you can't go without your passport. I said, where's the lady? And he said, and he looked and the booth was empty and she was walking across the airport in Moscow, walking across the airport with his passport, headed towards a door that was a long ways away, some secret door. It's not secret, but you know, secret to us. And in my spirit, I knew that something was wrong and, and standing right there in the middle of the airport, the three of us standing together, I pointed at her, I said, no, 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 in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I take authority over that thing. And I said, I command it to stop and you turn around and bring that passport back here. She almost stopped dead in her tracks. She stopped like this, pivoted, and came walking right back and handed him his passport. Who knows what would have happened? I'm telling you, the name of Jesus has power. Has power. We were doing a crusade in Argentina. Billy was along again that time. And there was, uh, there were people were, we were in outdoor meetings, and there was people that lined up big lines, and we'd lay hands on them, and we were seeing people get healed and delivered and set free, and they brought one gal in, I don't know how old she was, I would say mid-20s, maybe a little bit more, and a, a mother of some children, and they had to carry her in, and she was <clears throat> jerking and doing all kinds of things, and they put her in line. <coughs> they said, she needs help. You know, it was evident to everybody, she needed help. And I walked over to her, and I grabbed a hold of her, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command this foul spirit to loose her and let her go. And she dropped to the floor and started slithering like a snake, her tongue going in and out of her mouth. I said, in the name of Jesus, you come out of her. And I walked away and told Billy, go over there and finish that up. <laughs> well, we would already told it to come out. <clears throat> What's it going to do, defy? No. So he went over there and took, took the rest of the, took care of it. Amen. Listen, the authority in the name of Jesus works for anybody. It works for anybody. Sometimes <clears throat> you can be just trying to see if it works. It still works. It still works. We've had different people that have been in such conditions or situations that sickness or disease there's no hope medically. There's no hope with doctors. There's no hope that they could at all ever come out of where they're at or be, be healed. I've been in hospitals where people are dying and you lay hands on them and use the name of Jesus and they come back to life. So many different testimonies and stories of using the name of Jesus. Sometimes outdoor crusades in churches and buildings. We had a man that was 71 years old in a meeting I was doing in Boston area in a wheelchair. I went over and laid hands on him. I said, in the name of Jesus, and he got healed and got right up out of the wheelchair. We've had people come out of wheelchairs. We've had <clears throat> people that were in very death-type conditions get healed. We've even had a man in East Germany that was declared dead come back to life by using the name of Jesus. Power in the name came in the resurrection. The change this day, this day, today, the name still has power. Today, the name of Jesus is still alive. Today, the name of Jesus still causes hell to tremble and quake. The name of Jesus still releases angels on your behalf. And the name of Jesus will still forgive your sins, and wash your sins and cleanse you and change you into a new creature in Christ where you are not the same as you used to be, but you are different completely different, completely new. Hallelujah. Listen, I just for a moment want you to just bow your head and close your eyes. <clears throat> the most important decision you ever make in your life is to accept Christ or not. <clears throat> I was in Mexico preaching and a 
young boy walked up to me and he said, it must be amazing to live in the United States of America because everybody there is a Christian. I said, it is amazing to live in America, but it's not because everybody's a Christian. So they call America a Christian nation, but unless you have a relationship with Jesus, you're not a Christian. So this morning, I don't know the background of every person in this place, but I know this, that Jesus loves you with an unfailing love. Jesus loves you. He loved you so much that he went through the agony of the cross. He was wounded, bruised, and smitten, whipped, scourged, and hung on a cross. One of the most horrible events that could ever happen in anybody's life. It was so horrible, physically. What they did to him was so awful. But he went to the cross willing because he loved you and he loved me. And he wanted to have a relationship with you. So I don't know this morning where you're at in this process, but I know this, that Jesus loves you. Enough that he came, went through the cross, was crucified, died, and rose again from the dead so you have the opportunity to know God personally, to have the Holy Spirit come and live in you and dwell in you forever, to never be without appropriate help. Isn't that amazing? If you could comprehend how much God loves you, you'd willingly give your life to him forever. It's so amazing. I, I'm not a new starter at this. I've been, over 50 years ago, I gave my life to Christ. Not one day have I been unhappy in that decision. So today, if you're not right with God, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And so I'm going to ask you two questions. If you've known God, walked away, you need to rededicate your life. Or if you've never accepted Christ and you would like to this morning, it would be an honor to pray with you today and help you to find Jesus as your Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I really want to give my life to Jesus, I want to rededicate my life, I just want you to lift your hand and wave at me, and I'm going to pray for you. How many people, I see that hand, how many people would say, I really want to rededicate my life, give my life to Jesus? Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Unfailing love. While you were a sinner, he loved you. Let's do this this morning, this way. There's people that raise their hand in here. I want to do it this way this morning. Feel impressed to do it like this. We're just going to pray. And then if you raised your hand and you mean business with God this morning, you repeat what I'm going to say where you are. And the Spirit of God will come and your life will, if you're rededicating your life, will start over. If you're starting new, the Spirit of God will come into your life. It is so phenomenal. I can't describe it. I can't explain it, but it'll change you forever. So let's do this together, everybody. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I receive Christ as my Savior. Forgive me, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, for living for me, for dying for me, for raising from the dead for me. And I receive you now as my Savior. Devil, you leave me alone. In the name of Jesus, I've given my life to Jesus. I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody, let's put our hands up and rejoice. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can do that today because of the resurrection. Isn't that wonderful? Because of the resurrection, we have a relationship with God who comes and indwells us and will never leave us or forsake us. And I really like the way that's worded in John chapter 14. He'll never leave us without appropriate help. <laughs> Sometimes you need to remind yourself of that. that we have appropriate help living on the inside of us. Any <laughs> any situation, any circumstance, we have appropriate help. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Sometimes my wife needs to remind me. And I'm reminding you. Hallelujah. Come on, I think we ought to have a shout. Hallelujah. 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 Will everybody just stand for a moment? <clears throat> One of the people that attend church here has to be at work today. Recently, they gave their life to Christ, her and her family. And we were visiting with her a little bit on Friday. And she said, Pastor, what are you going to do for everybody if you, if they, if you start going too long? And, and it's Eastern, they're going to want to go eat with their family and what are you, you going to do? Or how, how are you going to know to stop? And Kelly was with, and I, I think it was Kelly that just said, you just go like this. So she goes, okay. <laughs> so, well, so she said, Pastor, I'm going to be watching you. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys got a song? They're going to have a special song. Did you want to do that before or after the offering? After the offering. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you. I thought they were going to sing a song. So we're going to receive the church offering. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I was wondering how I could get through everything I had today and still get you out of here before Perkins was full. So look, if you're gonna um, if you're gonna um, write a check, you write it to SRC. If you're gonna use a credit card, please fill out all the information on this um, offering envelope. And uh, you have to write your CVV code on there because I didn't put a spot on that envelope when I redid. When I redid the envelopes, um, I wasn't thinking about people using their credit card. So write, write your CV code on there, CVV code. And then if you're texting to give, it's 612-431-1420. Did I cover all the bases? Cash in an envelope with your name on it will give you credit. It's important that you mix your faith with your giving very important. And um, there's uh, some scriptures that we could read and should read. You know, we, we want to be uh, tithers. Scriptures about that. Let's just read one before we continue on. Go to Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, it talks about tithing. You say, well, that's in the Old Testament, yeah, but it goes into the New Testament, too. It talks about tithing. Israel is concerned about things that are going on in their history and in their life. They're having some difficulty, so they're praying, and they're asking God why they're having difficulty. And God, through the prophet Malachi, answers them. And he said, you're having trouble because you've left my ordinances. We find it in verse 6. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. 
Then he says this, return to me and I'm going to return to you, <coughs> saith the Lord of hosts. But then they say, uh, wherein shall we return? And he says, God says, will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me. They said, where have we robbed thee? And God says, in tithes and offerings. So really, what was he saying? He was saying that they positioned themselves in a spot that they weren't happy about because they weren't paying their tithes and they weren't giving offerings. <clears throat> so what did he say to do about it? Just return and start. Yeah. Amen. It was pretty easy, isn't it? It's a simple solution. And so I don't know where you're at in this whole process. I know some of you, I, you know, I'm, as the pastor of the church, I know how your giving goes and so on. So, but... Um, don't allow the effects of this situation financially in the world, whatever's going up or whatever's going down, to affect your giving. <clears throat> because the giving is your supernatural supply. It's the way God is going to help you. When you pay your tithe, you connect to, <clears throat> I always call it your covenant connector. You connect to the covenant of God when you pay your tithe. It opens the door to God's... He, he always wants to do much more for us than what He is doing and we limit what he can do by how we respond to the word. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we're knowing the word and we don't respond, then we're limiting what God can do for us. So he says here, verse 10, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. What's the storehouse? That's where you get fed. If, the, if this is your church, that's here. Well, how much do we bring? All the tithe. All the tithe into the storehouse. And then what's going to happen? There'll always be seed or meat in your house in other words, there'll always be a supply of whatever you need available to you. God said he's going to open the windows of heaven. He did that when Jesus came. He opened heaven's windows so we have access to heaven all the time. And then he said, I'm going to pour out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive. And he goes on with other promises that will happen when you tithe or pay sow seed. So anyway, I want to just encourage you. Obey the word. I've had people come to me and they say, well, I don't, I don't feel led to tithe. You don't have to feel led. It's in the Word. You just obey the Word. There, there are times. I, I've been a tither ever since I got saved in 73, a consistent tither. <clears throat> and so there's times maybe I didn't feel like paying the tithe. I, I really don't think I ever had that real discussion. You know, I just was something that God dealt with me about and I've just obeyed. So I never think about it that way. But I've had people come and tell me, well, we just don't feel led to do that. But it's not a lead feeling, it's, a, it's the scripture. You know, it's what the Bible said. So we just obey. And I've been very blessed. God has blessed me in a lot of different ways and continues to bless me because we are consistent tithers and also seed sowers, givers. Oh, there's been times we have to use our faith, you know, to pay our tithe. It's not just obedience, it's actually <clears throat> knowing what will happen if we do. Knowing that God still loves us if we didn't. He still loves us. He just becomes limited in his ability to do things for us because we're not being obedient. Doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Somebody talked to me one time and said, well, if I don't pay my tithe, will I still go to heaven? Paying your tithe or not paying your tithe doesn't have any bearing on you going to heaven or not going to heaven. It's your relationship with Christ. That's a good spot for an amen. It's your relationship with Christ, whether you go to heaven or not. <clears throat> Obviously, at some point, if you continue to disobey the word, your relationship with Christ isn't too good. So then you better examine that. You know, but it's your relationship with Christ. It's the blood of Jesus. It's not the tithing. It's the blood of Jesus. The tithing opens the door to great benefits to you in that relationship. And sowing seed, God will multiply your seed, see, and different things. So, amen. We teach on giving because we want you to mix your faith with your giving. Right? Some of you are looking at me like, Dad Hagen would call it a cow at a new gate, you know, so a calf at a new gate. Are you ready? This is my tithe, my seed. I pay it. I sow it because I want to participate in God's plan of increase. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, dying for me, raising from the dead just for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I was going to do something else concerning giving. Do you want me to do that now or after? Okay, you sure? All right. 
So I wanted to talk to you just for a minute about a seed offering for the church. So we're going into spring. We've got different repairs and things that are coming up on the building, on the outside. And I was praying about this, and I talked to the Lord about it. And he said, uh, I want you to do a seed offering on Easter Sunday and have the people sow seed towards the church. Now, we've sown seed this year towards Cindy Black. We've sown seed towards Pastor Joe Wakoya. We've sown seed to the seagulls. We've sown seed in many different areas. You remember February? Kind of were just people coming all the time, and we sowed a lot of seed and all that. And God's, what the Lord said to me, he said, it's time that you challenge them to sow some seed towards this building, this property, their church, that they could sow over and above their tithe and over and above their giving and sow seed. So uh, I said, well, how do you want me to do it, Lord? And he said, I want you to do it like you've done it before. Last year we did it this way. And so I asked my wife to write some envelopes. And she's got dollar amounts on the back of the envelopes. This seems to work pretty good for us. Seems like it works in your wheelhouse a little bit. And so... Um, she wrote envelopes with uh, different dollar amounts on them. It doesn't mean you have to give this dollar amount. We could, um, you can write your own dollar amount. You know, this is just a suggestion. I've got some that say 1,000. I've got some that say 500. And I've got some that say 250. You know how we've done this in the past. And so this is what I would like you to do today if you're interested. I'd like you to take one of these envelopes that you feel the Holy Ghost is dealing with you about, a dollar amount. I already know what God dealt with me about, so... My wife and I, we're going to take a $1,000 envelope. And so we're going to put our name on that. You want the whole packet? Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so we're going to put our name on it. Now, I'm not asking you to do this today. If you can do it today, I want you to do it today. You understand? Because we've got stuff we need to work on now. But if you can't, we're going to give you, let's say, what do you think? 60 days? 90 days? Okay. Whatever you think. 60 days, 90 days, what it's going to take for you to do what you feel God is talking to you to do about in your spirit. And then, uh, but I would like you to fill out the envelope today, if you know today, and put it in the offering today, even if it doesn't have any money in it, so I can start tallying what people are going to do. See, it just makes it easy. And then when you give it, you can just put another envelope and write on it, this is my pledge. So we're going to call it a pledge, what we're going to do over the next, um, sometime between today, let's see, today is April. Basically, so April, May, June, how's that? By the end of June, does that sound good in your spirit? You know, uh, if that works for you. If, and, and, you know, we, whenever we've done this, it's always so interesting that people hook their faith to it and they get excited about it. And when they do it, the money comes. And, and many of them have done it twice, three times in the process. You know, they, they pick up a $1,000 envelope. Pretty soon they've given 5000 or 3000 or Something because God comes, you know, we're going to put our faith on this, see? And before we leave today, we're going to have communion. And we're going to have communion over the stuff that we're doing. And we're going to have communion because this is what Jesus did. He shed his blood for us. And we're going to, that's what communion is, remembering what God did for us. What a great day, Resurrection Sunday, to have communion, see? So I, I, I am hurrying. I want to make sure I can do everything today that I was thinking about. So who else wants an envelope? We got 250 ones. We got other ones, 500 ones. So here, you help me with this. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to do it today, uh, text to give would be under building. So this week we had an exciting adventure in the building. We had uh, the snow back up some of the drains, and so we had some water stuff that we had to take care of. We've got some different things we're going to do as it becomes spring. We want to go after the parking lot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Want to go after the parking lot. Amen. Want to go after the parking lot. How many like not to lose your car in the parking lot when you drive in in those holes? <laughs> We're going to work on the roof again. We're going to work on the parking lot. Um, we've already contracted someone to do the windows again this year. So we've got a lot of different things we want to do to bring the house of God up to what it's supposed to be. Isn't that right? Yeah. Chrissy said amen. amen. Shout it loud. Let them hear it. Amen. There you go. 
Remember, we've started a new series on Tuesday nights on family and marriage, children, and another word. <laughs> Diane, you, wanted, you said you wanted me to say what the word is? I said, so we're going to also discuss the subject of sex. Oh, there's one gasp. <laughs> you need to learn biblical values in your family. Marriage, what it's really supposed to be, biblically. The world's design is so off right now that where can they learn right things except in church? They need to learn about these things in church through the scriptures. I've asked the, the youth group to be down in the services on Tuesday night for a while because we're going to talk about what is really a family and what is really marriage and so on, relationships. And this Tuesday, my wife is going to do the, she was supposed to do it last Tuesday. She got a snow day, and then she said if she could be just relieved of it, and I said no. And so I said study because there's no excuses come next Tuesday. So Lorena is going to start, then other people are going to be involved in this. I've asked some of the other ladies that were doing different services to, to do some, and, and we might even ask a couple guys to get involved. <clears throat> but I want you to have different perspectives from godly people and scriptures, uh, what it means for family and what it means for marriage and what it means for relationships, and even in an intimate relationship. Hallelujah. We got an amen that time instead of a gasp. That was good. All right. Everybody get the envelopes they wanted? Okay. So ushers, just go ahead and pick those up. Again, if you're going to text to give on the second part, you put it under number two. Write your name on them. This would be the building offering, the second offering, right? Yes. Hallelujah. We're going to get our building paid off this year. Get our building paid off this year. Amen. We're believing for $10,000 a week in our income. Are you believing with me? $10,000 a week. I remember when God started talking to you about that, I thought, well, that's, we don't need that much and all that. But as today, if things have risen and changed and everything, we need $10,000 a week. No big deal. We're believing for 300 people, right? Yeah. To attend this church on a regular basis. 300 people to attend this church on a regular basis. We are not very far from that. If you realize, we're not very far from that. This is a big sanctuary. So you look around and you see some empty chairs and so on, but you know, a few Sundays this year already, we've almost had full capacity. And there's 200 chairs set up in here. So 300, we're not very far. Amen. So are you going to be in agreement with me on these things? All right. So do you want us to do communion before you sing? No, you, I don't know what you're going to do. So, What are you going to do? Sing now. Sing now and you guys can get the communion ready. Right? Yeah, you can get communion yeah. ready. Get the communion ready. You sing now. Hallelujah. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen 